Yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone attending our webinar. Um, I think we're getting a little bit famous on our webinar, and I think today we have a very nice one. Um, I'll start first with the small house rules. Um, we cannot hear or see you. Um, so please, if you have any question during the webinar, please put it in the question box. And um, if you have any um, audio problems, please try to uh, dial in. It's all in the invitation. You can find the technical part if you have problems. And otherwise, uh, well, thank you for being with us. Next, please, Gustavo. So today we will have a webinar on success success stories on exporting specialty coffees um, to Europe. And we have a very interesting um, panel uh, going to share today with you all their um, stories on exporting coffee. So very warm welcome to uh, Adri, uh, Yadian, Gloria Gumenus, and Rodrigo Samia. And I'm also very delighted that we have three um, very wonderful, beautiful coffee people. But we also have from Central America, from Africa to Asia. So we have all the three different time zones and three very different kinds of co coffees. And so thank you very much, everyone, for taking your time and being here with us. And of course, the interesting part will be led by also, I think in the meantime, also very famous with our webinars is Gustavo Ferro and Lisanne um, Grothuis. And they will present our panelists um, more into deep, uh, into depth and themselves when we will start um, the uh, interesting part. Uh, I only want to give you a very short introduction on uh, CBI. Next, please, Gustavo. So, uh, and myself, I'm Jantin Rutte, and I work for the um, CBI, the uh, Center for the Promotion of Imports from Developing Countries. And I'm a program manager for our market intelligence studies for coffee, but also for cocoa and home decoration, home textiles. And I've been myself a coffee trader for more than 25 years. So a small explanation of what we exactly do at uh, CBI is we support small to medium-sized exporters um, in developing countries all around the world in setting up projects and basically to strengthen their economic, social and environmental sustainability through exports to Europe and to also to regional markets. And we do that by creating um, uh, value through knowledge and developing networks in, the, uh, in Europe and developing countries with the promising sectors. And on top of that, we do uh, enter into a bottlenecks um, to set up these projects for uh, small to medium sized exporters. And one of these big bottlenecks is a lack of access to good market information. And that's why we are basically here today. And that's what we try to um, issue for you. Next, please. We work um, within CBI, we work with target countries. You see them here on the screen, which are at the moment our target countries. It's in different regions of the world. And we are working in certain sectors. And exactly, we work in 14 sectors. Sectors. Next, please, um, Gustavo. We are, we are active in 14 sectors, as mentioned, and well, obviously today we're here for the um, coffee sector, but here you can see that we're also in which other sectors we are also uh, active. Um, next, please. We make, uh, within CBI, we make, as we said, market information studies, which we uh, present um, on our website for free. So it's accessible to, um, to all the small to medium sized exporters. Um, and there's a lot of relevant information. And we divide basically these studies into market analyzed part and a market entry part. The market analyzed part is about um, trends and demand in Europe. So there's a lot of statistics there and what are the main trends and uh, well, what can those do uh, on opportunities for you. And on the market entry part, we have studies like buyer requirements, uh, tips for finding European buyers, tips for doing business, uh, organizing your export to Europe. And uh, recently we have added there um, tips to go digital. Next, please. We also make, um, as we call them, country uh, fact sheets or product fact sheets. In the case of coffee, it's many times country fact sheets. Um, so we have uh, fact sheets um, on the most promising uh, ex export uh, countries or products in Europe. It gives you more in-detailed information about a certain country or a certain product. 
and we provide what is today uh, free webinars which we all place them on our website so you can always have a look at all the ones that we have done already and we make news items which we distribute on uh, social media um, next please uh, well, this is the um, the end of the CBI uh, introduction. I'm quickly going to give the floor to um, to Gustavo and Lisanne, who will introduce themselves, as I said before, and to our very beautiful free uh, uh, people, coffee people uh, on the uh, on the success stories of exporting to uh, Europe their specialty coffee. So, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Jantin. Um, yes, so I'm Lisanne Grotas, Dutch, uh, based in Colombia, uh, and I work for a Dutch consultancy firm Profound, where we facilitate uh, sustainable trade promotion. And that means that we do a lot of market research, uh, provide support and compliance, uh, but we also uh, facilitate more directly um, uh, market access activities. Uh, I am the market uh, researcher for the CBI studies that Jantin just explained for both the coffee and the cacao sector. Um, and I do this together with uh, Gustavo. So in the next slide, he yeah, will introduce himself. Exactly. I'm Gustavo. I'm an independent consultant uh, working also uh, externally for CBI and as an associate consultant for Profound in those studies. Uh, I've been working on this for 15 years and since 2008, actually, I have been somehow involved in the studies for coffee and cacao. And I'm also working with some other organizations uh, in, in in, in coffee and also in cacao and other natural ingredients. And I'm happy to be here again, presenting something to you guys. And uh, what I wanted to tell you guys more or less what the agenda looks like for today. Uh, today, we're gonna, of course, introduce our three main panelists and uh, they are the ones that uh, are the main actors here and we are gonna hear a lot from them. Uh, we're gonna hear about uh, three main issues and then you guys, of course, you'll get to ask your questions as well. Uh, first, we'll talk about how to establish a business relationship in Europe, and then we go into the subject of uh, complying with market requirements, uh, product and business promotion, and then we have the Q&A session. And of course, uh, you can ask these guys anything. You can ask, also ask us as panelists as well, uh, success stories, the lessons learned, and some tips from uh, them and from us as well as the authors from the studies. Um, this is just to remind you guys that this is not, of course, the first time that we are doing a webinar. We have two webinars where you guys can search for uh, information on the CBI website. The link is right here. Uh, last time, actually, the idea of talking to exporters came from our last webinar where we talked to buyers. And the idea came to actually hear from the exporters. So this was actually quite a nice thing to follow up on. And then, of course, we ha also have a webinar on mapping markets and finding buyers, which is a very uh, interesting one and something that is requested a lot from us. And Exploring Eastern Europe was also one of the webinars we did. And as you guys can see, we're also always publishing some news items uh, to keep up to date with what's happening on the coffee sector. So you can find all this information on the CBI website. Uh, so very quickly, just because they will introduce themselves a little bit better, we are here with Adri from Indonesia, with Gloria from Kenya, and with Rodrigo from El Salvador. And they're going to quickly tell us about their company. So we're going to start with Adri and his introduction. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Adria Dian. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Ontosoro Coffee. We are an exporting company uh, uh, that facilitates traceable and transparent trade of Indonesian coffee. We established ourselves in 2015, so we're kind of new. Um, yeah, the aim is to facilitate uh, our partners uh, to promote their coffees. Uh, to international buyers. Uh, today we are representing around 700 farmers from 90 different organizations in seven producing regions across Indonesia. Uh, yeah, next. Next. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we, as I said before, we started in 2015. We we don't know what we we're doing, so we, are, we were really slow going off the ground. Uh, for the first year, we only exported 600 kilos of coffee. 
but then uh, we learn by doing then by uh, every uh, everything that we have uh, um, learned so far and then in 2019 we have managed to reach uh, the first 50 tons of export milestone i know it's not a it's not a huge amount uh, compared to other exporter but we are proud that today we are representing uh, more and more farmers uh, across Indonesia. Um, our, um, our EU clients, our biggest EU clients uh, is uh, Decide Up. Um, they are an importer of specialty coffee in the Netherlands. And through their relationship, we've been able to uh, increase our uh, pool of clients such as Wakuli, Selecta, special roast and other specialty uh, uh, roasting uh, companies across uh, Europe. Um, the coffee that we exported uh, actually throughout the years, 79% um, have been uh, Robusta, 21% uh, is Arabica, where uh, of which 97% of them are specialty. Uh, coffee and uh, as you can see we also do uh, different uh, cup scores depends on the profile of the uh, of the clients that we do um yeah uh, i think that's the short introduction for us uh, thank you and thank you so much adri uh, yeah thank you uh now let's hear from gloria and her story about sakami coffee Thank you for having me. Good afternoon and good morning. Uh, my name is Gloria Gomez. I'm a coffee producer and a co-founder of Sakami Coffee. I'm also a founder member, founder and member of Association of Women in Coffee, um, Kenyan Chapter Information. Uh, Sakami Coffee is a 50% owned um, uh, family-owned business estate and Sakami Coffee was established in uh, um, 2004. We only got in production in 2011. The farm is located at the slopes of Mount Elgin, which is the home to salt, salt licking cave elephants and uh, buffaloes today and numerous monkey species. At 1,800 meters above the sea level, we grow coffee under the canopy of macadamia trees. And this unique Kenyan Arabica coffee has a several varieties, which is Ruiru 11, Batiani, SL, and K7. All these are grown in individual blocks. We produce specialty coffee cuppings. We produce specialty coffee with the capping scores of 82 to 89% um, capping score. And we also produce, we also do fully washed coffee, natural process and anaerobic, especially for our clients. Um, the vision of our company is sustainable production in respect of financial environment and social aspects. Sustainable, sustainable utilization of resources and to uplift the other farmer community around us. And for this, we have our unique selling point. We are fully traceable uh, story of our environment and social impact in our community. And we believe working together with others. Thank you, Gloria. Maybe I can already ask you the question. Uh, this is a very interesting story. What are your main types of clients? Who does this story appeal to on the market? Thank you very much, Gustav. Uh, our main market is in Europe, uh, where we are dealing with the, these guys we know already this side up, and also US, Asia, and um, every other importer, large scale, large to micro roster uh, rosters, and whoever else shares our dream, which is farm to cup relationships. Great. So you're also working directly with some rosters. Yes, we are working directly with some rosters in Europe, 
and uh, this, this setup, yeah. Great, thank you so much. Now let's hear from Rodrigo. Good morning, good, good afternoon, and maybe good evening to everybody. Thank you for the opportunity, CBI, for presenting ourselves to the world. Hi, Adri, Gloria, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And thank you, Gentien, Lisanne, and Gustavo, and all the CBI work team. And thank you also for you attendees for, for hearing us. And I am lucky to be part of a family coffee producer in El Salvador. I am part of the fifth generation. It all started more than 100 years ago when my great great grandfather arrived to the American continent. He came to the into the Panama Canal to participate in the construction of it, and finally he he came to El Salvador, where he rest until his last days. So he so everything started with him. C'est lui l'étranger. He is the foreigner, and that's the the reason of our coffee brand. We are specialty coffee producers located in the eastern part of the country. We have three main coffee varieties. Those are Pacamara, Bourbon, and Cusetleco. As you may know, Pacamara is one of the tasty and varieties in El Salvador, the, the more tasty ones. And it, it, it was produced in the 1950s in, in, a, in, a, in a laboratory. It was a, it is a hybrid of pacas and and Maro hippie and those and two varieties from El Salvador and also we have bourbon which in its origin is of the Bourbon Island near Madagascar and also we have the Cuscatleco variety and which was created at the beginning of this century in the 2000 years and we have seen some coffee processes and for in total the as you may know the most common process in the world is wash and also honey but we have we have made our effort to be innovative to, to innovate and we started producing natural and natural anaerobic because we saw the importance of differentiating and it's important not to, to sell as as most people do in the market in, in the market if if you if you can differentiate yourself from others and I highly recommend you to, to go in that way. And our social initiative is named the Coffee Hope Project, where we help small and medium coffee producers to stop producing commercial coffee to be de and to be dependent of the C price of the international price of coffee, and to start producing specialty coffee so they can acquire a, a higher price and a more stable price finally becoming a true business. Thank you all. Thank you, Rodrigo. That's a very interesting story. And as you said, fifth generation, and this is what is interesting about these different stories is how much the coffee that comes out of it is so charged with stories and such a nice trajectory that you guys have. It's true. Uh, Rodrigo, I, I wanted to ask you just one question because um, you have the social initiative and you have the specialty coffees, etc. I also wanted to ask you, what market does this coffee appeal to? And what are your current clients in terms of the different channels that you are uh, working with and different segments that you manage to access in Europe? Okay, well, I was I was lucky to, to study my undergraduate studies, my college studies in Chile. So I am with my brother, Fernando, we made some contacts over there and we started in exporting to Chile, to South America, which is something in, it's not common because almost everybody looks to North America or Europe, but we look to South America, which is not common. So, and, but, but we, we made our effort and we got in over there. And we export also to, to, to Europe and also to the Middle East. And our main channels are definitely our web page, which is important. And if you are not in the internet, you, you, you don't exist. That's important to remember always. And also our Instagram and profile right where we can have a, a a faster communication with with importers with roasters with buyers 
Great. And uh, in terms of the types of buyers, are you selling mostly through uh, intermediaries? Did you manage to access roasters directly? What is the main type of well, buyer? We have, reached, we have reached roasters. I, and I could say that maybe half and half, half roasters yeah. and half importers. But all, it's always better to, to reach um, roasters so, so, you, so you can gather more of the value chain, right? Awesome, thank you. And this is exactly maybe the first point of discussion. Uh, I know that we get a lot of these requests and it's one of the most read modules from CBI, which is finding buyers. I guess that's the main question that uh, businesses have to organizations like CBI. And also a lot of the questions that we get when we have this kind of webinars. And we have actually had a webinar in the past. CBI has a module on finding buyers, so you guys can find it on this link that you can see here. But I wanted to know from you guys, um, because of course, it's not only about identifying and finding buyers, but there's a whole story on making that first approach on deciding if this is an ongoing or if you're going to terminate a certain relationship or if you're going for the relationship or not. And of course, maintaining the relationship, that's an essential part of actually consolidating the business and having a sustainable sort of uh, entry into the market. So this is what I wanted to ask from you guys. And I wanted to um, start with Gloria. Maybe um, my question is, how did you manage to first find your buyers? In what kind of context? And how did you maintain such relationships with the buyers that you currently have? Thank you so much, Gustav. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, question because uh, my first time how I met our the buyer we have now, it took us some time and we were attending an SEA meeting in Europe, a coffee event a couple of years ago. And I walked in this room, it was quite colorful. I was only two years into our plantation. We had just planted our coffee two years down the line and we didn't know what we were doing. So we were like, let's just take ourselves to this coffee event and go see what happens. So we were walking through, everything was very careful until we, uh, as we were exit, almost exiting out. Then I saw this, uh, a pile of um, stack boxes together and they were just very plain. The only sign on that was this side up. So I was like, okay, what is this? Then I walked to the stand and I asked the guy, is this a direction or what does this mean? And uh, there was a gentleman there who said, no, 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 we, uh, this side up, we are actually uh, importers and we are green bean uh, buyers. And this is what we do. We buy green bean and we are looking for to work directly with the producer countries or producer farmers. So uh, it was quite interesting. Then I told him, oh, we'll be very interested to do business with you. This is quite interesting. And I gave him my business card. I said, we talked to you a couple of, uh, in a few years. Then down the line, um, we met again in a fine, Afri a fine African cafe um, association in Mombasa. And both of us, I didn't know whether there was a representative from uh, this side up. I was being sponsored by Markup, uh, which is a program that was happening here in Kenya. And we were in this meeting as producers to go and uh, there was a meeting for us producers meet the buyer. So we were in there and there they are and I met this guy and I said, oh, I met you, someone from this side up a couple of years ago. So this is my sample and we are having a cupping on this day, especially, can you, would you be interested? And they said, yes. Then they came and did the cupping and that was the beginning of our relationship. Uh, six months down the line, we were ready to sell our first container to them. Wow, six months. That's uh, in the world <laughs> of relationships. That's actually quite fast. And they, uh, I they really it was know. all this uh, couple of years up um, that we waited and we didn't know we'll meet again. But yeah. Exactly. The wait time. time between the first meeting and actually re meeting, it was the longest time, maybe, but like the, yes. the start of the relationship, maybe due to a good click. Have they visited you guys in this beginning? Like, what was the time, like, in, within the six months that you were establishing relationship that they visit you guys in Kenya? They uh, send a representative who is also a partner who is buying from us as well directly. That's Tin Beans, uh, who came to 
visit our farms and I introduced him to all um, uh, other neighbors that we have around us. But um, it was, uh, we gave them the sample, they knew what they wanted and they asked what they wanted, how they wanted the process to be done. And as you know, this relationship take quite a while to do this. Yeah. And for us, that was the beginning of everything. Great, thank you so much, Gloria. This is a really interesting story, how by exposing yourself and searching for the unlikely, <laughs> you found uh, this relationship. That's very nice to hear. Thank you for the story. Maybe, Rodrigo, can you share a story with us on how you identified buyers? You already mentioned that Instagram website is very important. Maybe I would like to know if these were the means through which you found uh, buyers at first, or maybe differently, you use different techniques. Well, actually, we started looking on the internet, like putting just specialty coffee roasters, specialty coffee buyers, and email them. Then we got our web page, our Instagram, and for example, one day I remember it was a Thursday night, and a, a potential buyer, as I said, and and wrote us on 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 Instagram, and he messaged us. And next day, Friday, we were already talking by in Zoom, and seeing if there was any any possibility to 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 arrive to a to a contract and, and to sell him. The coffee and also as, as gloria was saying that she spent six months and with with this buyer i remember that we spent 14 months with a buyer i remember that there were times that i wrote to him through whatsapp or maybe through email and he didn't answer me and i and i said well maybe maybe it's 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 the last time and, and th there's there's nothing to to do but one month after and he was and he was he was telling me oh and I, i'm a sorry and sorry rodrigo and I was very occupied, but but finally now I can I can I can answer you. And I was like, oh, it's there's there, there's an, an opportunity. So 14 months after the first contact, we 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 made um, our and we sent him our coffee. In 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 this case, with with one buyer. Awesome. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to know maybe a detail from something you mentioned that you were sending emails to potential buyers. What kind of information would you include there in this first email, the first approach? Well, it's in, it's important to to and to write a, a short message, a short email, just to present yourself briefly, maybe and tell 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 the potential buyer and why are you interested in him? Maybe because of his social approach and his environment approach. And so, so maybe those those points and why are you interested in him? Also, what can you offer him? And 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 to see the possibility if you can have a phone call with them. And if you maybe if you send a hundred emails, maybe you will and you will find answers for ten maybe or or just five. But 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 there's opportunity over there. But you mean it's personalized, so you would find something that you could relate to, and then you would bring yes. emphasis to that. Yeah, that's very nice. Uh, because not about all your, uh, only about yourself, right? It's about the match and the click between exactly. you and exactly. yes. creating the bridge. Yeah. That, that's important, like like to, to make the effort to, to segment the market, right? Yeah, and to find what is the priority or what is important for that type of buyer within that segment. Yeah, that's um, definitely. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Thanks for the story. Uh, Adri, can you share a story with us on how you identified and re develop relationships? Yeah, I mean, um, in 2015, um, we were quite dubious. We don't really have a social media presence. <laughs> we don't really have a website to offer. But um, as like Rodrigo, we are we just uh, searching in Google, um, searching to few databases of bias, and we, we we find um, some buyers to contact through email. Uh, one of them is uh, Leonard from the side up. Um, we uh, we know that he they haven't have any Indonesian of coffee offers uh, offerings in their in their lineup. So um, I was offering uh, at that time coffee from uh, Java, but uh, he replied uh, declining our offer at that time. Um, um, he he said um, he was looking actually for coffee from Flores, which is a different area of Indonesia altogether. Um, he then asked about 
where can I buy coffee from Flores and where is the um, who is the exporter there who is uh, with uh, the meal um, and then how we could ship the coffee from there and then I, I, I just replied okay um, we have a few cooperatives that we know uh, this 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 is the meal and then um, I even uh, we even uh, hooked link him to a, a shipping company so um yeah i mean after that email okay i i wish him the best <laughs> um but uh, then um he uh, replied that um, he requested that if we could find uh, send us uh, samples from coffee from flores and in that email he said if you were if you could give us uh, some samples from flores we would love to work with you and uh, yeah, from that moment, uh, as they say, the rest is history. Um, and I think the key to maintain the relationship is just openness and I think willingness to to help each other, even though it's not the, your initial initial uh, intention. Mm-hmm. So uh, there are bound to be mistakes, force measures, and whatever. But uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, I've never met Leonard until the third. Um, until the third year, uh, all our communication by then was um, emails and through WhatsApp. And at that time, Zoom was not a thing. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, we just through chatting. And and um, well, not only at the uh, only until the third year, we met a representative from this side up. Um, and then they visited us in Indonesia, and uh, we tour them into a few of the regions that we are partner with uh, at that time and we just show them whatever we could show I mean no sugar coating you know, and tell them the best and this is the best and this is the worst that you could find here and then let them decide on their own whether you they want to expand the partnership or not so yeah Good. I think your Dutch style That's honesty all. maybe was the winning element here. <laughs> maybe this transparency yeah. was very appealing <laughs> to a Dutch buyer. Um, yeah. And uh, it's funny, like one thing that I picked up from what you told us is that you identified the gap. Usually, uh, well, not usually, but sometimes exporters go to a, a website of a buyer and they see if they're already exporting from their origin. And then they think that's interesting, but you did the other way around. You identified the gap, which is a very interesting approach. You anticipated that could be interesting for them. So that's um, that's something nice that I picked up from what you guys did. <clears throat> Thanks for the story. Now I just uh, I will just give the floor to Lizanne to talk about the next subject. Yes, the next subject, um, maybe a drier, but very important subject. It's about legal and and, and buyer requirements. Um, Of course, to to access the European market before establishing, uh, or not before, but to enter, uh, it is very important to comply with strict uh, legal requirements and food safety demands, et cetera. Otherwise, you will simply not be allowed access to the European market. Uh, We will not talk about this. Again, we put a link here. Uh, to the study we wrote about uh, all the legal, non-legal uh, requirements um, that you yeah, should comply with to enter uh, the European market. So please uh, have a look after this webinar or whenever you, you have time for that. Um, but to, yeah, we would like to talk a little bit, uh, not necessarily about the legal requirements, but more about the additional buyer requirements here that often have to do about quality uh, criteria, but also about uh, certification, sustainability um, uh, things. Um, uh, demands. Um, and um, I would like to ask the first question to Adri, uh, Adri specifically, and this was uh, is the question uh, whether you have had uh, or what has been uh, the main issue faced um, by your company uh, in terms of compliance with these uh, buyer requirements and uh, also how did you deal with that? Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, in my humble opinion, I think there are four steps, the four types of um, compliance that, in order of uh, importance, the number one is the uh, food safety, uh, which is actually in a, uh, when you are exporting a specialty uh, coffee, it's it's to be honest, it's quite easy to make because you are you you have de- you have designed. Um, you have designed uh, your business plan according to uh, 
uh, meeting that for safety standards. And the other three in terms of reports is quality, quantity, and logistics. And uh, out of those three, by far, if you ask specialty coffee, um, uh, by the man. Explorer, the issue is quality. Um, the parents high, very high standards of um, uh, of them, and um, and across the years that we have been exporting to uh, uh, various countries, uh, including uh, in the European Union, European Union. Um, it is one of that uh, thing. The quality is one of the um, that is quite hard for comply. We, uh, we received them quite a separate. Um, this order was received in uh, October, uh, November, and we uh, we expect we were expected to send uh, the coffees between um, December and January. So it's quite a it is it is quite a small time window. So we decided to help our producing partner at that time to undertook some of the milling process, which we never have done before. <laughs> and uh, um, we and in this kind of volume, and therefore we and our experience kind of show um, that we, you know, after the coffee was um, uh, was sent, um, it was found out because um, you know due to uh, bad sortation and then our uh, lack of quality control and in, in the baseline is our ex inexperience of milling our own, uh, of the coffee um 10 percent of our coffee that was uh, that arrived in europe was defective and it kind of put us in a tight spot uh, we were really at the lowest point at that time and um, and the financial the financial consequences was quite dire and uh, but we have we have one thing that we really want is not to break the chain of supply. So we um, we first of all admitted our uh, inexperience and mistakes, um, and then we offer um, our client an alternative uh, exporter uh, that could do a better job than us um, uh, for. The, our producing partner, so that we we hope that the uh, the next year they will export again still uh, with a different uh, partner. But and then uh, yeah, I mean, but then they said um, they accepted our, our honesty and and they uh, even helped us assist us on how we uh, improve going forward. And um, and then yeah, I mean. It's a collaborative effort, but I think the main point is that number one, I think when you do this type of mistakes, you op you really need to uh, open up to it. I mean, you have to own it. <laughs> it is your mistake. It's no one else's mistake. And then, yeah, like just pure honesty. Yeah, we did a mistake. And then we try to offer, you know, a, a, a solution way out that benefits our partners. And then, you know, uh, in the end, it's all about trying to be uh, facilitating uh, with, between your as an exporter, you are facilitating your buying clients, but also your producing clients. So we need to bet um, their best interest at heart. So, yeah, I mean, um, you you learn this by doing and there are bound to be mistakes, but it's it's how you recover. I think that makes a uh, right now the relationship is going strong and it um, uh, slowly growing. Uh, thankfully, uh, yeah, I think it's a very interesting uh, example. Thanks for sharing this, and it just shows. Um, well, I should say that I guess we are all well, we are all human beings. We all make mistakes, and it's about good, honest communication. And it doesn't have to mean the end of a relationship, but it really shows being open, uh, being humble, but also being proactive. That's what I hear in your story. You come up with a solution on how, uh, or you came up in this uh, occasion to to help to, to, yeah, to find a solution. So 
Um, yeah, very interesting. Um, maybe uh, as a next part, because um, well, you mentioned the three things, quality, logistics, um, and, uh, and food uh, safety. Uh, what we also hear a lot from, from buyers and also from coffee exporters is the, the theme of sustainability. That is, of course, very important globally and also on the European market. It's becoming almost a must. Uh, and we get a lot of questions about certification. To what extent certification, for instance, is needed, uh, whether it adds value to your uh, business operations or to your products or not. Um, so... Um, yeah, maybe Rodrigo, uh, you could uh, explain us a bit how you address this topic of uh, your sustainability in your business. Of course, we already you, you told us briefly about the Good Hope project. Um, the, I, again, I said it wrong. The Good Coffee, the Coffee, the coffee Hope, Hope project. project. Sorry, sorry. Mm. Coffee Thanks. Hope project. Thank you for the question, Lisanne. Well, and we have seen yes, it's important to somehow have what do you have. What you must have in mind is that you are not only selling coffee, you are also selling, for example, your history and other, for example, is selling all the support that he gives to the 700 farmers. That's huge. And so, and how how can you show that and how can you demonstrate that? There's there's a there's a, a straightforward way, which is certification, for example, fair trade or an organic certification. If you if, if you support the environment. Which we also do with our with our agroforestry system in our coffee farm. So, but but we have seen in our case that certification is not cheap. It's it's actually expensive. You 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 must pay several hundred or a thousand of dollars per year. So it's it's not easy. If, and all and, it, and obviously it's it's more difficult if you are a small or medium coffee producer. So what we have seen, what we have and find is that you must ex and have this sustainability approach in our case is supporting our rural communities and also supporting the environment and as as you may know in in the world only only 20 percent of the of of coffee is grown and under shade under is is, is shade grown and and that's our case so what we have to find is that we can demonstrate that that we can show that um, to everybody and to the world and through our promotion channels, as I said, our web page and our Instagram. So it's 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 more difficult because maybe you don't have the stamp, for example, of fair trade, but but, but you have the pictures, you have the storytelling, and you tell in your potential buyers what you are doing, and maybe even they can come to your place and 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 you can show them. Well, this is what we do with our people. This is what we do with our environment. So you have it over here. And then we help our potential buyer our, our, or our buyers to also communicate this to their and to the final consumer, right? And and that could be the, in the roaster or, or 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 the people who are buying the cup. So and how how they can show this to them because because maybe the the coffee bag won't have the fair trade stamp. But they can say, well, this comes from the from the Coffee Hope project from El Salvador, and and have and have the uh, a small paragraph story, right? Yeah, I think it, it again very interesting and very uh, spot on. Uh, uh, yeah, how you deal with these things, and I think I just want to because I'm also looking at the time just uh, to give the floor to Gloria, uh, Gloria because. Well, we've talked about this before, of course, and I think you have a similar uh, view on on this topic. But uh, I would like to hear from you, uh, yeah, how 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 you deal with this um, the sustainability story. Thank you very much, Lesson. Um, uh, our our story is similar to what. Um, my producer country said, but what we have is um, um, certification is a really big issue in Kenya, and um, it's very expensive for a, a small or medium um, a producer. And this has been, it's not here nor there when it comes to our buyers, because uh, none of them or the ones we have, they have not uh, 
asked us to really give us certification as a, a main issue uh, or a main condition for them to buy our coffee. But um, when it comes to logistics and quality, things like that, in Kenya, we have uh, mostly our coffee is premium coffee. And uh, well, thanks to our system that has always been there through the, the coffee directorate, they have managed for uh, to help us to learn how to produce coffee from uh, 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 from the farm to cup or farm to logistics. So we manage that one very well when in terms of quality, but when it comes to logistic, is an issue for small estates, uh, and that's why in Sakami we've come up uh, when because when you get a client who is asking for volumes, it becomes very difficult for you to really achieve that. So that's why we've partnered with other um, growers for us to be able to do this logistic issue. And uh, with that, we have our uh, thanks uh, to our government and our other. Um, um, logistic partners that we've partnered with that have made us realize that we can do direct sales directly because uh, you can manage your coffee quality from the farm but then you can lose it when it comes to because uh, the production from the farm to miller and then from there to the export then you can lose the contact in between but with this it has helped us to do direct sales and that one is managing our quality and everything else but when it comes to compliant with the client's requirements, it makes it easier if you have some training as a producer uh, for you to understand your product, for you to know what you're selling to the client. So it makes it a bit easier. But when it comes to certification, it's still a really, really big issue. And uh, it's not cheap. It's not something you can wake up and say you want to do it on your own. So we are still looking for partnerships out there where we can uh, have other people come in and we can partner or get sponsorship for us as a community or a growing community to come up with a, a company that can help us do that uh, certification. And in Sakami, as you know, we've been practicing palm culture where we regenerate uh, the soils, we, we, we grow our macadamia, uh, our coffee under shaded trees, but still, we need to give more. But that's the only way we are doing it to mitigate our, our environment impact as a farm practice is concerned and farm uh, sustainability farming. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and maybe just, just a, a short question about what you're saying about the certification, that it is still a big issue and also uh, how you are looking yeah, for partnerships. Uh, if I understand well, you're looking outside, but also within the communities and within surrounding uh, uh, coffee farms, et cetera, to, to look for ways to to make that happen. Is that what I understand? Is that what you, what you said? Yeah, we are looking uh, both ways. We are trying to get our partners because already the, the growers, the small estate growers, they're not big. This we are talking of guys who have got very, very small uh, estates and uh, they are willing to take a step further to do certification, but it's still very, very, very expensive for us to do that. So we uh, we've applied a few uh, international communities or buyer communities that we are talking our clients, our buyers as well. We've put it out there if uh, there is a way for them to help us um, come together and do this together as a collateral. So that yes. it's affordable for everybody. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, Adria, I don't know if you want to add uh, maybe something from your experience to uh, to this. Yeah. Um, in, in our experience, I think one of our uh, producing partners actually had a, a, a free trade certification. And for them, it's, it has been beneficial uh, in terms of um, promoting uh, their coffee. And I would say it um, certification such as free trade is um, is is much more is the beneficiary the beneficials um, uh, the bigger you are as a producing organization um, it I think it, it it helps becoming kind of an insurance 
where if there is, for example, uh, a shortage or a surplus of coffee, they could switch around uh, and sell coffee much more quickly because they have, you know, their certification and therefore big buyers are willing to uh, uh, absorb uh, 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 their coffee because of, okay, you have, you have for it, right? There's no question that this is very good for uh, their, their customers. So yeah, I think uh, there are there are benefits to certification in my in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, can I just comment on this one because it, this was exactly one of the things that we discussed during COVID that some buyers were looking for certified coffees for the big retail for supermarkets because that was something that was growing during COVID. So I guess what you're saying is exactly what has been seen during um, the pandemic because some of the excess channels for specialty coffee for the very high end were not functioning, so the commercial coffees were developing, but then the certification plays a role there because you are talking about the volume. So that's a very good illustration of that um, specific event that we all experienced in the last two years, two years ago, yeah. Uh, thanks um, for that comment, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, so I think yeah, let's dive into the next topic, uh, product and business promotion. Um, and and well, again, looking at the time, I don't want to take up too much time. And I think um, the thing is how to stand out in the crowd, uh, how to get your message across. And of course, also how to attract attention of potential buyers or how to maintain. Um, um, and um, yeah, maybe also the question is what kind of information to share or not to share. And as Rodrigo also mentioned, it's like storytelling and sharing the story to, to consumers and to end clients who actually drink the coffee. It's a big trend, it's very important. So um, yet, what kind of message are you sharing uh, and how? I think um, we can maybe skip the first question that we prepared that was on the main channels, uh, because I think most of us, we shared uh, like the channels we we, we use, because um, I, I want to make sure that we have enough time at the end for the questions. Um, and I think we should dive into the, the, the presentations or the two, the slides that we prepared for each of, uh, or that you prepared for, for, for each of you, um, that are, yeah, um, highlighting the main elements um, that you include in your promotional message. Um, and if I believe well, Gloria is the first one uh, yeah, to answer this. I think, yeah, Gustavo, you, uh, if you wanna specify the question. Yeah, let's let's just go back a, a few steps behind because we already shared how we use websites, Instagram, et cetera. And you can integrate that in your story, of course, but what we are interested in mostly is what are the main elements of your promotional message? And maybe you can also tell us your unique selling point that you use to stand out from the crowd. And of course, you have the slides to back up your story, and we are here to support you with the visuals. So go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, we, uh, as Sakami Coffee, we are in um, this region where we grow our coffee is actually uh, it's known as Bread Basket of Kenya, which is uh, they produce a lot of uh, um, corn. And as uh, coffee producers in this region is a new thing, so we came up with a way to um, talk to our small neighbors uh, to, 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 to join us so that they can also benefit from what we have already set up. And that's why when we started doing this and the setup on um, Instagram is all based on uh, on. Um, working together involving the small good uh, good farm practices sustainable farming and um, that is um, the message behind all our our instagram pages and when we are marketing and selling so and then we also have a reforestation where we started this project in our region and it's called fruit for forest uh, fruit for forest which is um where we plant the macadamia and it doesn't hinder you from growing anything else under it. And we can, at the end of it all, we can buy it and either you can grow coffee or something else. And that's a message we were passing out. And that attracted quite a few of our partners that joined us to really grow, came in a small scale, 
and together, when we put our coffee together, we have enough volumes for us to sell out there. And that's why when we put sakami, it's like a cup me because that's so we're very proud of what we are producing. It's our it's our from farm to cup kind of uh, project we have. Great. Do you get a lot of messages on Instagram from roasters or from consumers? Yes, we do get a lot of uh, inquiries. We get a lot of. Uh, I didn't know that uh, Instagram can be that. Uh, <laughs> um, wide but uh since covid everybody was at home everybody learned how to do online marketing i had no idea that this can work that far and wide but uh it has been quite an eye opener and um it's out there and i think that's the way for me to market my coffee in the future or anything else that we are growing it's been quite a huge response and a huge gathering and inquiries as well thank you that's a nice use of instagram <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Gloria, for your story. Now we hear from Rodrigo and his story on promoting his coffees. Well, as I've said, and our main promotion channels are the website and our Instagram profile. We we tried, we make our effort to show our quality, both our social and environmental impact that we have that we have in our communities, especially through the Coffee Hope project. Because what we do is that we, we make the effort to transform some, uh, to transform the lives of other coffee producers by helping them to, to start producing specialty coffee, which is a way of giving them stability in their coffee business. Because as, as, as you may know, the, the, the C price, the coffee price, the international coffee price fluctuate and too much and every every year and so that so we help them to we help them to come to our export chain by and increasing their quality and from a, and producing a specialty coffee and coming from a commercial coffee and also increasing their uh, the quantity that they produce so we have this approach of helping them in their quality and in their productivity. So we show this, especially with, with pictures in our Instagram and page, which I want to say hi to my mom because she's in charge of, of, of the Instagram page. So and, and I say thanks to my mom and good job. And I guess she's connected to the webinar also? And she must. <laughs> okay, then. Hi, where did you um, so I saw you, something interesting you have here on your website. Let me just go back one slide, which is a direct channel of communication via WhatsApp. Yes, that's, that's, that's very interesting because that creates the hotline, right? Yeah. Yes, I, I, I have it over here. Yeah, imagine like this is really uh, creating this closeness that you want to achieve with the customer. So not only is yes. it the idea, like the conceptual idea of the Instagram that you have the pictures, but also if they have a request or something that you have your your yes, hotline exactly. on. it's easy yes that's that's totally true awesome thank you for your story adri and guys now this is oh, interesting pay attention there's a whole model here that adri has developed for us so adri go ahead explain it to us um i mean for us um for me myself i'm not really a social media person or we are a tech junkie um and only until recently we have um, someone who is in charge of uh, social media and website and but it's not finished yet um so our main strategy bef uh, to this is actually more relationship based um understanding what uh, what actually what really the the buyers want so our whole idea is to really help uh, our uh, clients to promote our coffee <laughs> instead of our promoting our coffee ourselves. So um, yeah, as I said before, I mean the the first one is to um, discover the right partner. Uh, I think the the simple term you could find this in emails as emails and social media is the easiest way to find bias now. And I think the main uh, tips here, I think the main tricks is to find bias that are relatively uh, the same size um, that will be much easier for you uh, I think if you are a small uh, that's if it's a small 
producing uh, individual farmer, for example, it will be much easier for you to contact uh, roasters directly um, so that you have a kind of personal relationship. Uh, or if you are a bigger cooperative with 10,000 members, it will be beneficial for you, uh, much easier to contact the big buyers, uh, such as Olam or uh, Sukafina. Um, they, are, they are more willing to absorb your coffee uh, because of efficiency. Um, and then uh, after that, we, you want to offer the right solution for your buyer because uh, through virtual meetings, trade show, and also certification, you, you, ha you, you want to offer the product, the right product for your customers. Uh, and then, um, and also offer a short, medium, long-term services. And after that, after they consider your offer, it's time to really hone in on your how to buy um, your offering, so, you know. And for me, one of the, uh, I think, I think we all agree. I think the one of the biggest, uh, biggest no deal, uh, deal or no deal decision is the offerings, the, the samplings offerings. And uh, I think there is, in my opinion, in my experience, I think ninety percent of the go or, do, or no go decision of to to buy is from the samplings. Therefore, um, we offer a, a few different uh, samples that we uh, uh, that we try to strategize the buyers to opt in <laughs> and um, uh, the idea is to you know our clients have their clients and it's a diverse type of uh, partners and each partners needs a different type of coffee and that's what we try to offer um, and also develop the marketing story around it and um, and after you buy and then you maintain loyalty to uh, over the years, I think the main key is to develop a project together. You know, um, like like marriage, <laughs> you want to have a vision together and to do something together. Uh, otherwise, you get bored with each other, <laughs> and and that type of uh, <laughs> and type of uh, you know. That type of relationship and giving new ideas to new projects will will it is uh, we find um, and most efficient way to 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 uh, to maintain relationship uh, with our uh, yeah with our the examples with, with the side up maybe next slide so yeah um, we found the side up through uh, Google um, Google website in coffee is uh, dot me. Uh, and then we and then we clicked into their website and already they are the good middleman as their first at their first head page and we thought ourselves we want to be like them <laughs> uh, that's us I mean yeah so we share the same kind of values and then we saw their offerings they like they don't really they don't have uh, Indonesian offerings at that time yet so yeah let me help you with that um, and then we could help you. Uh, small, only like 600 kilos at start, and then we could scale up over the years. And uh, yeah, that's what we uh, that's what we offer at that time. Um, the first samples that we did, we consider this what type of customers uh, that the side up has, and so we offer three types of coffee. The first one is the exotic and rare coffee, uh, the Flores Mangare Juria, which is kind of uh, the the typica over there. And then uh, the classic filter coffee that will appeal to specialty coffee uh, uh, coffee shops. Um, the Flores Wash is Java Wash and Toraja Guguledo. Um, and then the third one is the value for money espresso for their clients that are very espresso based. Um, therefore, we give uh, them options on which one would be best for, for them to, to opt in. Um, and the good thing is they they tried three of them, so it's, and, and it kind of, it, it, it's great to see that uh, all these channels are growing. Uh, all this coffee has their own audiences. And uh, to maintain this relationship, we had so many ideas on how we could make uh, the, um, the project uh, together in the future. So 
we hone in on two types of project. The number one is the regenerative agroforestry project, we, where we uh, encourage, uh, we, we help assist uh, our producing partners regenerate their farming through planting uh, uh, um, uh, cash crops, you know, such as durian, uh, fruits, and, and peppers. And but also an, a curveball on that is the circular fashion project <laughs> where uh, we design our bags to be able to be used for a uh, fashion project for fashions um, so we use natural um, natural cotton as our bags where we um, um, how do you call it uh, where we use uh, natural dyeing uh, methods so therefore it could be used as a, as a you know as a fashion project so um, yeah I think this type of projects outside of coffee that the coffee will get you in <laughs> but I think uh, over the years there's this project outside of coffee that will entice buyers to be coming back and coming back and I think that's our strategy basically okay and uh, Adri, just one question for lessons on marketing where can people contact you <laughs> <laughs> it's very good no this is exactly this uh stepwise approach is exactly uh yeah like how we conceptualize it as well but the fact that you illustrated through this example it's so rich uh, this is really and thank you guys um yeah now we just move on to the questions but i i don't even know how to thank each one of you for your stories and to sharing your perspectives this is super valuable and um yeah there is no value, that's what I want to say to the stories and to your participation. So thank you so much. It's, um, and I agree with you, Gustavo. It, it was a very a pleasure to listen to very three different stories. Uh, you all have in common the extremely big love for the product. So that is, I think, the connection with all of us uh, listening to you. Um, but it's very good to hear the, the um, very different approach that the three of you have. So um, we do have indeed uh, certain questions. Um, I'm not too sure if we are able to answer all the questions within the time we have left. But don't worry, we will answer these questions later to the persons who have uh, addressed the questions. And we will give you the answer. Um, within a few days. So don't worry if your question is not there, we will take the time to answer this. And um, for the, um, I will put the question to Gustavo and, and um, who can address it to the person he thinks it's most um, easy to answer. But there was one um, a person who addressed, um, especially to Adri, it's to, um, you have mentioned the selling of 79% Robusta and 93% is specialty. Um, so they would like to confirm with you is that you export Robusta to spe specialty market. Is it the right understanding that you are exporting Robusta specialty? Because this is of quite a new market, I believe, in Europe. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh... 75, 70, 97% of the specialty coffee that we sell, uh, it's, it's, um, yeah, the majority is actually Robusta. Um, yeah, it, it is a new market. Um, we find kind of a niche over there that, um, uh, yeah, thankful, um, yeah, grateful to decide up that sees the opportunity that, um, um, that many of the, 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 the clients that uses this Robusta uses it for their classic blends of espressos. Um, they want to have a fruitiness of a, of, a, uh, of a clean robusta, but also still a little bit of bitterness that to that could penetrate the uh, the, the the milk. And therefore, um, you know, you could use this as a hundred percent, you know, hundred percent espresso offerings it doesn't need to be blended and anything so it gives flexibility to clients and yes yeah, it's, uh, it's the robust standard. thank you um Ustav, the next question is how do you predict the amount of coffee you want to process to make it specialty so or do you have an order on volumes already beforehand before you start processing or how so how do you decide what percentages will be then specialty? 
yeah, maybe it's was there another element to the question or that's the how to plan that's production according okay yeah. uh, maybe rodrigo can we hear from you because i understand that you're working very directly with producers and actually stimulating the specialty element in production so maybe you can clarify how you deal with planning production according to demand for example well right now our approach actually is used to produce as most as we can actually <laughs> that's 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 the real approach actually because and we have fun with the good problem that our clients are asking more coffee than we produce because the bad problem would be and to to not be able to sell off all of our production right so so we are always and and on the way of of finding and new buyers and that's actually that's our that's um, the point that we are fighting on to to to, to, uh, to find more buyers and we are also looking for financing because what we do and to to help a small uh, medium coffee producer and we also must help him and with some financing and because of all the labors that that, that, that he must pay and during the harvest so we also look for for this financing option and to help small and, and medium coffee, coffee producers but our approach right now is just to produce as as much as we can maybe 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 we can double the quantity or triple the quantity if we help in other other coffee producers and that and we think that that's fine right now with us got it so let's say the planning for the quality you you're not compromising on that and you're not segmenting that because demand is actually absorbing your quality but you do plan for the financial aspect of financing that specialty element yes. through the growers right okay so the exactly. planning goes on the financing mechanism yes that's it got it gloria do you do it differently or are you also just meeting your demand and you don't have to segment your production too much how does it work for you Thank you very much for the question, but uh, um, I concur with uh, Rodrigo what he's saying because um, all what we need to do is to, uh, or what we've been doing in Kenya is uh, the demand is there, but the production had gone very low. Uh, this year and uh, two years ago, it has been uh, because of the weather or something else and because of COVID and something else, but now we think we have a new thing on our hand but as much as we would like um, to put out there our coffee the demand is more and we are trying to just encourage the producers and try to find find the uh, financials for them for them to increase the production because the demand is there quite a bit and for specialty coffee the demand is just growing and uh, we're encouraging everybody around us They're like everything sounds expensive but give it your best because we have an open market now we have uh, people who can pay, who can pay um, good money. So all what you need to do is get, make sure you produce good quality and produce as much as you can. Okay, Adri, do you want to add maybe from a different perspective because you work with different growers also and maybe you have to plan according to that? Um, yeah, I mean, um, through, I think it, it, it to simplify it actually, um, I think the best way to describe it is that we have almost around um, six months of production, of coffee production. Um, we plan where the first uh, two months of production will go to the commercial market. Um, and then the later four months will go to into the specialty market. Um, so uh, the first uh, to the commercial market is, uh, is important also to generate cash flow. Um, 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 small, um, you know, small cash flow in a few. So, uh, and then the specialty will go into, you know, the the profits. We go into the profits. So yeah, um, yeah. I think I think it's not it's uh, it grossly overgeneralized, but uh, with the producers that we had, uh, the general strategy is that. Okay, so you're planning your liquidity also according to that because you get liquidity from commercial grades and then you are investing in your specialty exports through that. That's very interesting and it's a bit related to what Rodrigo said in terms of financial planning as well. You have a solution there 
dealing with your own product and exports. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the other question is, is about uh, working with um, cooperatives. And the question is, um, first of all, um, they thank you for sharing your, your experience and they would like to know the advantages or disadvantage of working with cooperatives. Okay, um, Adri, can you pick this question up? Gloria is growing herself, so maybe let's start with Adri, Rodrigo, and then Gloria can add at the end. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, um, I think uh, growing with cooperative is all about communication. Um, you re that, um, It's about, you know, it's there is no one person that in charge of everything. Therefore, you need to really communicate with a lot of shareholders. And um, you have to invest the time, um, invest the, uh, the resources that you have on building and knowing, uh, uh, you know, a lot of shareholders. And we have a lot of partners, on, not only uh, to support us. I mean, uh, we also have NGOs, uh, local governments that we approach to help. Um, also, um, our competitors, I mean, our colleagues, we, we help, we help together uh, to form a project or a, let's say a, an, an alliance to help let's say a cooperative you know it it's different towards um, let's say um, um, an, a coffee family or a coffee enterprise where you can deal with you know the top of the uh, the head of the uh, uh, the enterprise but in cooperative I, I would suggest the best thing to do is to have a networking of like-minded alliance that could help you and together um, solve uh, many of the issues that to, that, uh, that came with it. Thank you. Rodrigo, can you add to? Um... Yes, of course. Thank you for the question. And well, right now we don't work with cooperatives and we found that it's easier to work with, even with importers or roasters that have one, that are not that big because communication is easier and you, and you can go straight forward with 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 the person who is in charge but with a cooperative as Adri said you have to deal with many people and maybe they go in different directions so it's it's more difficult to to clarify where you want to get and and, and to advance in the process and to take decisions we, and we have found very beneficial to to have the opportunity of take fast decisions, so we don't so so they don't take and so they don't take and us and maybe six months to, to 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 do something, but just maybe one week. We say okay, and if if we do not agree in this point, what can we do? And and we can reach to that answer in in half an hour or in an hour in in a call, but with a cooperative you have maybe that could take weeks or even months right so you shorten your chain of course like in all matters as you said like on the destination market you're also working with a short chain and in your local market you also work directly with the producers we try that yes Got exactly it. exactly and, and and because we don't have that much time to deal with everybody right yeah it's a small company so yeah uh, thank you for that. Uh, it shows a different perspective. Gloria, can you add to the to your own perspective, please? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the question. It has always been a really, really big question for um, the buyers or other um, um, producers who come to ask for coffee or other buyers that come in to look for coffee. They're always talking about can we get a cooperative? But in the, in our concept is that we are just a very organized cooperative. <laughs> I like to tell it to everybody else that we are we are really just an organized cooperative in a way that I have very very small um, small medium little estates that we are together, we are the decision makers at the end of the day. So when you deal with us, the decision comes very quick. And when you deal with us, also the production, it, it, we, we promise what we can deliver. Quality, we also promise what we can deliver. So in this case, um, when guys or when buyers are always looking, oh, we would like to work only with the corporate, we're like, don't ignore us 
we are here we are just a better organized or cooperative because if i'm cooperating with uh, my small estate holders we are actually a cooperative no we are not just calling ourselves that because um it comes with a different definition uh in our constitution uh, as it is so we don't want to call ourselves that but we are just a very well managed organized cooperative and uh, we encourage our buyers to talk to us and uh, for that point we are like we can deliver quality we can deliver on time because everybody on that table is a decision maker thank you got it thank you so much we could be listening to you guys uh for hours because there are so many stories in your answers and it's very exciting to, to hear yantin uh you are the boss with the time keeping and just let us yeah, know we are running out of time um but i see that the attendees are, are, are still there if i can just take one last question and still two more minutes from everybody's time although i i realize that we are over the time but I think it's an important one because it's always the big question, the, the price. And um, so I think it's it's important with you guys as with your experience is because the question is, do the producers have the right price for their coffee, of course, and how do they discover or how do they know the price? And are the buyers paying the right price, of course, for the coffee and, and i think especially in let's say in the high there's a difference between the higher segment and the the, the middle or the, the normal segment but i do think it's important to also mention something on pricing uh, as it is a big issue in coffee it's a good question also maybe because they have the different price setting mechanisms as well and how they referenced the price so maybe gloria can you tell us a little bit about that I was so used to the other way, guys starting and I'm the last. But exactly. anyway, <laughs> I did it. I did it for uh, equity. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Okay, with us, um, our prices that we have, it, price has always been an issue for every producer and every producing country in their own individual capacity way. But um, but we have um, for us in Kenya, our prices are really regulated by. Um, uh our coffee exchange um at the in, the in the country level and for us somehow it protects us how much we can sell when it comes to our specialty coffee there's no way i can sell my coffee to a buyer lower than what uh, the market price demands so for us we we are we cushioned in a way and we thank god for the organized um system that we have in the country but also because uh, we are producing specialty coffee and we are putting in all these special processes it allows us to negotiate with a client or the buyer direct and for us that gives us an option and direct sales gives us a chance to negotiate for better prices and uh, now when we consider all um, inputs and everything because of what's happening in the in the world uh, we think uh, that is going to be a big uh, reflecting of the price because we don't know what's going to happen. The prices inputs are very high right now. So we don't even know as we are growing, we are moving into almost picking season and we don't know how to price our coffee because the inputs are like triple from what we bought last year because of what's happening in the world. Yeah. Uh, how about logistics in terms of uh, that increasing cost as well? How, how, how are you guys yeah. facing Oh, that one is also a factor to look into because uh, we have like uh, with our buyers or direct sales, we had kind of agreed that we can go with a steady price for a couple of years. But now I think it would demand us to go back on a drawing board because um, logistics are high for the uh, importer or exporter. And for us, it, the costs are very high in production as well. So we really, really need to meet. That's a thank God for the direct sales, because uh, we can actually talk and negotiate and see where we can meet. Because it's affecting us in the production and the buyers. It's also affecting them because of the since the COVID, the freights are double or triple, and there are no um, availability of containers as such. Yeah, thank you for your answer. That's that shows many angles to this 
to the question actually you, you gave uh, this very complete answer thank you for that uh rodrigo thank can you. you tell us a little bit about how you guys experience it and also maybe including some elements of the current situation on um higher costs as well well and and thank you for the question and for what jen chen was asking about the pricing and it's important to 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 try to gather most information that you can right just to ask your friends and to which price are they selling their coffee so so you can have an idea right and start negotiating with the importers and see what's what's the best for for both of 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 of, of us and to the importer and, and us and with the cost yes it's true and our costs have gone up and and we 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 saw an increase in salary and and also an increase in the in the inputs in in the agricultural inputs so we are we are expecting what what can we do and by increasing our price we are not sure right now when which path to take but we are confident that we are going to 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 reach a good one Thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, Adri, can you also reflect on this question, please? Um, yeah, I think our uh, discussion with our partner is um, for prices. First and foremost, the prices needs to reflect their um, their individual income uh, in such that um, what uh, what prices they receive must at least or above the you know the. Uh, the poverty oh, sorry the uh, the minimum wage uh, you know on the area um, so um, therefore after that we could add you know a competitive level uh, of um, competitive level of coffee so for example like um, like a fan robusta we um, we we don't really have a, a competition yet <laughs> um, uh, not not a lot of competition in, in that niche market so therefore we could you know, we could increase steadily the prices so that it be, uh, we so we could uh, have a little bit more, um, you know, uh, price gouging um, to maintain. Right? But there is also, um, uh, yeah, you know, and then after that, you, after that, it is all about, you know, trying to see your competition, which is, uh, and we're not just talking about co Indonesian coffee, but um about around you know kenyan coffee also El Salvador coffee also brazil um, we want to have at least you know if we have if we have a coffee that scores let's say 88 points we want to see what other countries could offer at, at that cup score you know if it's if it was say nine euros then okay let's try nine euros and we offer that so um that's how we yeah so for us it's all um um, inward first and then outward you know, and outward price gouging. Yeah, thank you. Because you also are purchasing, so you have to make that calculation within. Yeah. Um, guys, thank you so much. I, again, thing, tell us if this is. Yeah, I, 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 with pain in my heart, I have to close the webinar I <laughs> because I think we could go on for hours. Um, moreover, for Adri, it's very late. <laughs> So uh, I don't know what to take up more time. We will do, uh, as I said before, answer all the questions. And we will share all the information with you and the recorded webinar. Uh, I don't know how to say thank you. So thank you, gracias, um, for really sharing so much information uh, with us and with our um, attendees. I think it was very valuable. And uh, I give the floor to you, Gustavo, to close it. Yeah, no, again, thank you guys so much for the valuable stories, especially that come charged with information and things that everyone can get inspired on. And this was the idea of the webinar. So looking at the objectives, I think we more than reached the objectives of what it, we tried to do here. And I give the last word to Lizanne, who's uh, the colleague. Who has been enjoying. No, <laughs> I've been enjoying this a lot. Thanks. Thank you all, and we will be in touch for sure. And also for the attendees uh, to uh, spend an extra 15 minutes staying with us to listen to all the great stories and lessons learned. Thanks. Thank you, all of, all of Thank you. Thank you all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Bye. 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 Bye.